Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalist Roundtable, the state has officially certified the results of last week's special election on Props 123 and 124. And the Secretary of State continues to blame others for failing to send election pamphlets. The Journalist Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon's Journalist Roundtable. I'm Steve Goldstein, in for Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times. Thursday's canvassing of last week's special election results has officially certified Prop 123 and 124's passage into law. And Mary Jo, what did the governor have to say about what happened with Prop 123 specifically? He said it's a great day for Arizona. It's a great victory for Arizona parents and teachers and kids. He was he turned this canvassing event into the celebration that they sort of never really had on election night because we didn't really know which way the vote was going to go. Not to be too gauche, but were people buying this? Oh, well, the crowd there yesterday, you bet. I mean, this was full of people who had been party to the lawsuit settlement, to the closed-door talks, full of teachers. There were some students way in the background, lawmakers. So, yeah, it, was, it went over very well. Except for what he wouldn't say, which is we're not sure if that money is going to flow by June 30th. We know that State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt, who heads the five-member Board of Investment, sent a letter to the Attorney General and said, you know, we still have this open question of do you need congressional approval before you alter the, uh, the formula from 2.5% of the corpus, the, the principal of the trust, to 6.9%. Then another unusual question. Apparently, the way the law is worded, the, the Enabling Act, it says that this can only money can go to benefit schools that are un, totally under the control of the state. Well, now, charter schools are public schools, but they are run by private for-profit operations. Can they share in it? So sometime between now and the end of June, uh, Mr. Brnovich perhaps needs to get a little word out in terms of where we go from here. And Plus, there's also a federal court lawsuit on this. Yeah, and in fact, this particular issue was fleshed out uh, during one, uh, a hearing uh, when they were uh, deciding what language to use in the publicity pamphlet, and uh, former Congressman John Shadig was there, and they asked him specifically, he was talking specifically about a, a 1999 federal law, the last law that amended the Enabling Act. And in his opinion, uh, that legislation, that federal legislation, pretty much gave Arizona carte blanche uh, to decide what to do, how to distribute, distribute the, the funds. Of course, as Howie mentioned, there are those who, who think that you, know, you need congressional approval. Mm -hmm. Uh, before you can do it, uh, any change. Right. So there are some questions that are still lingering over Prop 123. And, you know, yesterday the governor, I think, was trying to say, look, you know, the voters have spoken. Let's get this money, go into the schools. And he said, you know, it'll, it'll be getting there next week. Um, I talked to his spokesman this morning, and the sense is that as long as the money is dispersed, and it's 250-odd million dollars, um, by the end of this fiscal year, which is June 30th, all is good. Teachers' raises mostly don't kick in until the beginning of the next budget year, which is, is on July 1. But the governor certainly would like to move on. Um, Treasurer DeWitt, who has never liked Prop 123, said, look, even if I was the biggest fan, we can't you know, cut a check next week until we get a green light from the Attorney General. And, and remember that the investment board consists of two Ducey appointees, the head of his Department of Financial Institution, the head of his Department of Administration. And this was a unanimous vote by the board to seek the opinion. So you can't say this is all Jeff DeWitt. Now, when you say, though, that the governor didn't mention about this, how he's not bringing this up, are you saying he's trying to hide from this, or does he truly not believe there's a problem? I, I think he believes, uh, la, 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 I don't, I don't hear anything, I don't see anything. Well, I mean, he recognizes it, yes, but, but he, he said, we're here to talk about positive, we're here to talk about today, we're here to celebrate. But he did acknowledge afterwards in talking with all of us that, yes, I recognize it, and when we pushed him a little bit, he, there was a little bit of peak there about Jeff DeWitt saying, you know, any elected official who would dis disobey the will of the people should be ashamed. Right. The governor certainly wants to move on. He wants this issue behind him. I think that's not going to happen quite uh, as soon as he wants it. Yeah, we'll see. And also, you know, the governor in his defense said, look, he sought a legal opinion, um, you know, 
back last fall, you know, can we do this without having to go to Congress to amend the Enabling Act? And that opinion, which he has never shared publicly, but mm -hmm. he says it, it gave him the all clear. Yeah, I, best of you, by your best your opinion. The other piece that, that's also waiting is the whole promise during Prop 123 is this is the first step. Mm -hmm. Well, the Children's Action Alliance and some other groups got together earlier this week and they said, well, okay, that's about $300 million a year. But if you actually look at all the cuts that have been made in inflation funding, in student and in, in teacher training, in full day kindergarten, we're still about $1.2 billion <laughs> short. A small gap in there. And we keep pushing the governor, so what's next? What's next? And he keeps saying, we're working on it. So whether it's Dana Neymar or Joe Thomas or Dick Foreman, the fact they're saying this, are they, is it falling on deaf ears, basically? No, I think the governor in his wants to do something. The question of what becomes the issue, what's politically saleable, we don't know who's going to be in the legislature. The other thing we've got that it's, that's hanging over this is you've got a governor who was elected on a promise to do a tax cut every year he's governor, which leads to the question, how can you increase aid to schools even as you're, you're cutting the revenue sources? Uh, and that really is uh, a big question, right? Because the, the folks who... Um, are pushing for more money for schools have also pointed to tax credits that, uh, or tax cuts rather, that we are currently implementing and are saying, look, if we just suspended all those uh, tax cuts, then we would generate, uh, I think in my, in my cal calculation, about $900 million over three years that the state would get. And they're saying, look, we can use that money to give to schools and uh, do all the things that we want for our children. We can do them without necessarily raising tax taxes if we just suspended those that we have already... Uh, oh, okay, but you know the political reality is to suspend a tax cut may require a two-thirds vote. Correct, and not that's gonna not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I think what the governor is trying to do is, is how he said, we don't know who's, what the legislature is going to look like after this fall's election. He's sort of keeping his powder dry on the money question and trying to turn the focus to outcomes in the schools, test scores. And there's a good argument to be made that, you know, you don't want to just throw money at it. Um, however, the groups that had their news conference on Monday made the point that, look, this is money that the state had committed and then they reneged on. And, and we know mm -hmm. that a lot of the no vote, and it was, you know, what, 49 point two percent or something of the voters said we don't like prop 123 it's not because they don't like education they wanted more so this was a way for them to sort of put their foot on the accelerator and say okay we got to keep going more on the financial front as well and what's really what's really interesting is that the governor has a uh, uh, has cobbled together this uh, to my mind a diverse coalition of people who are pushing proposition 123 you got the schools you got the AEA, the teachers' union. You got the business community. You got pretty much every major Republican uh, figure out there, except of course Jeff Dewitt. <laughs> and then now the question is: Does this coalition persist? And I think it, it will continue to exist, and it will be up to the governor to try and harness this coalition to to, to do something else. To so do what what would be next steps? You know, three, uh, uh, four, five, and six. I think the coalition is a, is a great point. But Howie, I'm also curious. I know we're looking ahead a little bit. How much do you expect? the impact of Prop 123 or just K-12 funding in general to affect August primaries? Are we going to see more moderate challenges, which is kind of the opposite well, of what we've seen? Well, the group that got together sort of hinted around, you know, gee, folks, you ought to be asking your candidates, what do they think? Not just, do you support education? Yes, I support education. But are you willing to support someone? Now, the problem becomes, as we all know, we have you know, gerrymandered legislative districts where perhaps only four, five, six maybe legislative districts are really competitive. So you end up with Republican districts, Republicans running to the right, Democrat districts, Democrats running to the left, and then we get a choice in a few. I think there'll be some hard questions asked, certainly. Does it make a difference? I don't know. You know, you, you, you're looking at a lot of those legislative races, Mary Jo. What, you know, do you think it's going to make a difference in terms of defeating some incumbents? Um, you know, a lot depends on how the districts are drawn and how the questions are framed because everybody's in support of education, mm -hmm. right? You know, but does that necessarily mean you support more money? Um, it, so a lot will depend on how um, constituents ask that question and, and what they're looking for in terms of a pro-education commitment. I think at the end of the day, it really hinges on whether the Democrats can change the partisan ratio in both chambers. If they can manage sort of narrow that gap, for example, in the state Senate, uh, 
uh, maybe they have a chance to push more money for schools or, or maybe, maybe stop more tax cuts. But unless we see those kinds of changes, it's, it's really hard to, I mean, j just based on what we've seen this last several years, really hard to push the legislature uh, to raise taxes, for example, for schools. Well, you'll never get the tax hike. What you may get is the coalition that we saw, mm -hmm. the same coalition that put kids care finally on the governor's desk, saying, we get the message. Uh, and it'll be interesting, because you have some really high-profile races out there uh, among people like Barbara McGuire trying to retain her seat ag against uh, Frank Pratt. You have a, an interesting race out in Paradise Valley with Kate Brophy McGee running against Eric Meyer. What's interesting is that Kate is part of the moderates, and so you know there's not a lot of choice there, I suppose, for some of the voters. Let's talk about someone who was a moderate when she was in the legislature, but now has decided, I guess, to take on Big Blue. Michelle Reagan versus IBM. Where does that stand out? Oh, Lord. Well, first of all, I think the Michelle Reagan that ran is not the Michelle Reagan in the office. I don't know whether this is bizarro Michelle Reagan or whatever. You know, we've talked around this table about she ran on a platform of getting rid of dark money, and now, well, gee, I can't do anything about it. The, what happened is we all know somehow 200 plus thousand ballot brochures didn't get mailed out. She blamed it on IBM. IBM said, wait, you know, the contract was up. You wanted help, get help. Then she would blame it on, a, on an outside contractor. Well, it turns out that what they didn't say is that the help they asked for the outside, when the outside contractor was for the presidential preference primary and not the May 17th primary. A lot of this comes down to the fact that she got rid of a lot of very qualified people when she went up there. Now, I don't know whether this was political or whatever. She put in her own people, and then we're trying to figure out, can she run an election? And I'd also like to point out that in their report, because Attorney Tom Ryan had, had uh, filed a complaint, as you know, asking what happened, what went, what went wrong, the Attorney General's office investigating uh, this issue. So the Secretary of State's office you know, uh, did their internal uh, review. and. And one of the things they found out was that there was a, a supposedly a change made to the uh, the household uh, uh, list of, of household voters in 2011, and that list uh, that change excluded uh, uh, voters who are on the early uh, permanent voting list. The, the the interesting thing about that is that t between 2011 and 2016, we'd have we'd had what two general elections, and we didn't have this problem. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it goes back to Howie's point. Uh, that same report noted, I think in a footnote, that yeah, we don't have the guys who ran those you know, previous two elections in, in the office now, and that might be a key to really solving this mystery. And that's what brings us back to IBM, because the Secretary of State's um, Elections Director, Eric Spencer, maintains that, look, the continuity to understand how this works from cycle to cycle rests with our vendor. That transcends staff turnover. We're going to have staff turnover. Um, you know, and IBM, of course, has said, no, wait a minute, you know, we, and they were still under contract when they were st apparently starting to build this mailing list, um, but they, um, they say, we, an we were asked a vague question, we answered as best we could, and the dispute goes on and on. But, you know, for a report that, you know, that it was written to try to figure out what went wrong and being <laughs> issued saying, look, we, the Secretary of State's office, we take full responsibility. There's still a lot of finger pointing going on. And that's really what struck me the most, the, the finger pointing, the, the blaming others. When this thing became public, uh, you know, uh, Michelle Reagan's office uh, uh, came out and essentially said, yeah, there was a, a supposed vendor error, but we take responsibility. At the end of the day, they're in charge of sending out this publicity pamphlets in time. And so to see them now start blaming others and, and sort of saying, yeah, we're to blame, but, you know, they're to blame too. I mean, that's the thing that struck me the most. Well, there's another piece to this. And remember, I'm, I'm the old one around here, and I remember the Nixon administration. And as you know, with Watergate, it wasn't the burglary. It was the cover-up. They knew in late April that pamphlets had not been mailed. April 22nd. And, uh, you know, though they say maybe it's the 25th, but whatever. They knew in late April. This is an office that manages to send out a press release when almost anything happens. Oh, but we were busy fixing it. How about a press release or a call to Mary Jo or a call to me saying, hey, can you let your, your readers know if you didn't get a pamphlet, here's where you can go, here's where you can call. It took a week or more for them to even acknowledge it, only when questioned by somebody at KJZZ that, oh, ooh, gee, we forgot to tell it. Well, so 
What does this mean for Michelle Reagan's reputation? More importantly, the Secretary of State's office. Is there a feeling, Mary Jo, that maybe the public is questioning whether they can trust? Is there a feeling of incompetence? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of questions right now about that, and um, all eyes will be on the August 30th primary election. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got a couple of months um, to go. I understand that um, Secretary Reagan has decided to not attend the um, GOP convention, which is happening, I think, two weeks before the election. So, you know, to stay home and sort of tend to your, your main job, which is to pull off a good election. But yes, it has, it has fueled skepticism because there's been a series of errors. I also question, um, you know, how much trust there will be. She's preparing a report on what happened, what went wrong with the March 22nd election, which seemed to be mostly a Maricopa County problem, not a Secretary of State problem. But, you know, you're going to have, she, she's got a report. I don't know when we're going to see it. And the other piece of it is we're going to be looking at legislation next year. As Mark Bernovich pointed out, the problem is we have a violation of the law here. Mm -hmm. It says the Secretary of State shall mail, shall send. Well, what happens when the Secretary of State doesn't send. Well, Mark Bernovich said, gee, I don't know. And he used some uh, rather um, uh, mixed terms for, for, for public television about how he felt about it. And the question is, so how do you punish somebody who does not comply with what should be a ministerial act of doing your duty? Howie, finally on this one, I'll come to you because you have chased many a politician in your career. <laughs> Does it matter, do you think, to the general public when they see Michelle Reagan after the canvassing sort of trying to get away from the media, getting on the elevator, looked like kind of a funny scene, and yet this is the Secretary of State not wanting to talk to the press? Well, any time you chase a politician into an elevator, and this is great television, you know, you, you end up with a situation where the public sees this and they think no matter what she has said, Images matter. This isn't radio. This isn't, I can't, you know, have the sound of the elevator door slamming. Mm -hmm. A Secretary of State backed up against the wall, sweating, clearly not listening to the questions, and then being chased into the elevator, that's going to stay with her a long time. Now, we've already mentioned Attorney General Brnovich briefly. Uh, let's talk about this bathroom directive from the Obama mm -hmm. administration. Luigi, tell us about that. How did this get started, and what is Mark Brnovich upset about? What is Diane Douglas upset about? So this all started in North Carolina. The city there passed an ordinance saying we're going to protect uh, transgender people. And the most controversial part of the ordinance, it says that uh, those um, that transgender men and women can go to the bathroom uh, of the sex that they identify with. And so the, uh, the legislature there uh, quickly passed a law that said, nope, you can't do that. And as a result of that, there was a lot of back and forth between North Carolina officials and uh, federal officials over uh, you know, wh what this means and whether they're allowed to do it. And finally, the Depart U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice came up with this guidance. It's not exactly, it doesn't have the force of law, but it's a guidance. And essentially, it, it, it threatens schools that don't follow this guidance uh, that th their money, their fellow funds, uh, would be withheld. And what the guidance says is that it doesn't matter if people if in your community uh, do not like this uh, or object to it, you have to make sure that transgender students can go to, that there's no discrimination against them, and they can go to the bathrooms of the sex they identify with. And as a result, well, we have officials in 11 states suing the feds over it. Mary Jo, does this feel deeper than Arizona's usual fights with the federal government? No. I mean, I think it's sort of, you know, par for the course. Uh, the, a lot of it's, you know, going um, against executive orders or directives that have come from the Obama administration. Immigration comes to mind. And this is a hot-button issue, and we are mm, in an election year. Yeah. And, you know, there's another, you know, piece behind all this. There's the sovereignty issue, you know, we know best. But there's another way to look at this, because I, I got into it a little bit with Diane Douglas when she had a press conference supporting the, the lawsuit, because she's technically a, a, a plaintiff in this, with Brnovich representing her. And that's the issue of, well, okay, the what are the community standards? We should let communities decide it. Well, should we let communities decide how to treat black students or Hispanic students? And it's a slippery slope there. And I recognize you know, race and, and, and religion are protected classes, whereas sexual orientation, sexual identification is not. 
But this issue of what should be decided at a local level gets very, very tricky. How similar or different is this to what lawmaker John Kavanaugh brought up a few years ago when the city of Phoenix was going through various things? It, it, there's some parallels there. This was dealt more with businesses and whether businesses could be disciplined for telling a customer no. Uh, based on your plumbing, you have to go to this bathroom, you know, as, as silly as that sounded. He couldn't even get that bill out of the legislature, which shows that perhaps people in Arizona don't think this is as much of a problem as Mark Burnovich, Diane Douglas, and, and Governor Ducey do. Um, I don't know if there's a problem. And this becomes the question of, is any of this a problem, a solution I mean, I to a problem? I haven't seen it being a problem. Have you seen any stories about you know, this being a problem? It's no, just such a small would... group of people that we're talking about. And the feds are basically trying to say, let's make sure that they are protected. And yeah, I mean, you know, transgender people, um, you know, have nature, they have to heed nature's calling just like we do probably a couple times a day. This has been happening apparently without, you know, riots in the street. So I don't know if this is a solution in search of a problem. And that's the thing. And going back to the Phoenix case, you know, the fact, Phoenix ordinance said that, uh, and Tucson, which had a similar ordinance since 1999, has said this is the rule about you get to use the, the restroom and locker room of your sexual identification. The world has not ended. And so I'm not sure who's looking for a cause here, whether it's DOE, Department of Education, yeah. looking for a cause, whether it's maybe even you could turn it around and say the gay community, uh, Human Rights Coalition is looking for a cause since gay marriage is no longer an issue. So maybe that's part of what they want. Well, I think we can certainly expect to see some campaign ads based on this particular topic. As far as campaign ads go as well, Luigi, we're seeing already John McCain ads against Ann Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. yeah, the General election not even decided. Yeah, that primary is not, not over yet, but they're... they're Right now, they are fielding ads against each other, uh, presuming, of course, that they will both win. Well, Kirkpatrick has no uh, no challenge in, in her party. John McCain does have a couple of challenges. In any case, uh, what we are seeing is that the two campaigns have seized on the most uh, hated uh, issue by each party mm. and 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 run with it with ads and saying, you know, the the other side is is, for example, in in John McCain's case, Kirkpatrick saying, look, his best pals with uh, Donald Trump. And in uh, McCain's case, you know, he, his campaign is saying, uh, uh, Kirkpatrick is very proud of her uh, Obamacare vote, and that's problematic. Well, of course, the funny part about him being best pals with Donald Trump, while he said he'll support him, you remember the insult that Donald Trump made about, well, he was a prisoner of war. That makes him a loser. I don't support losers. So I'm not sure I'm ready to paint John McCain as, as, a, as a Trump fan now. I know he's not, and that's the, the, that's the thing about it's it. It's the uh, discomfort. It, it, it's yes. what, the, what the Kirkpatrick com campaign is clearly trying to do is tie Donald Trump around John McCain's neck thinking that that would boost her performance within uh, independents, women, and minority groups. But, but the, the problem with that, look, we have sat around this table trying to figure out how the heck did Donald Trump happen in the first place? Every political rule that we have known in all the years we've covered politics seems to have been violated. You know, I made the horrible prediction on the year-end show that Donald Trump would not win one primary. Well, we'll, we'll I'm sure I'll be hearing about that. How do you even explain that? You know, it's nice to say that Ken Patrick thinks that, you know, hanging Trump around uh, McCain's neck will make right. a difference. I don't know. Right. I was going to say then to your point, you know, so these ads going back and forth, I mean, wh who knows what's going to happen. And in fact, I spoke with uh, Robert Graham just this afternoon, and he is very confident, or at least this is what he's saying. He's saying that he is hearing from minority groups, from the Muslim community, for example, and they're not exactly... Uh, uh, completely afraid of Donald Trump, if you will, and some of them had sort of uh, expressed some um, some statements that may be construed that they may support Donald Trump. Now, of course, how he's right, we, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, this is this year has been so disruptive in the sense that we, you know, and, and every time he opens his mouth, Mr. Unscripted, we get another up. headline. Right. Yes. Yeah. All right, just a few seconds left. So Jan Brewer has become very tied to Donald Trump. Is this going to last for her if Trump happens to win? Oh, I, I think it, it will. I mean, I don't see her as VP material for a whole variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. But look, you know, she loves Fox. Fox loves her. They found somebody to talk because, because Trump was had his problems with Fox. So, the, hey, we've, we've got Jan Brewer to talk about, you know, the border, immigration and all that stuff. So Jan Brewer became the stand-in. Look, if, if Jan 
if Trump does well, Jan does well, so does Jeff DeWitt, remember, because he also is supporting him, and Jeff, as you know, is not running for re-election. Who knows? Maybe there's a U.S. Treasurer position out there for Jeff DeWitt. <laughs> and a picture on the $10 bill in three decades, right? Oh, I like it. <laughs> Mary Jo, Luigi, Howie, thanks for the discussion. Appreciate it. Monday, it's a special Arizona history edition of Arizona Horizon, as we'll talk with the author of a biography on Arizona's first elected governor, and we take a look at some rare stereographic photos of Arizona's past. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, we'll talk about how possible Colorado River water shortages will affect our state. Wednesday, hear about affordable housing for seniors. Thursday, Ambassador Kurt Volker joins us in studio for an update on foreign affairs. That's all for now. I'm Steve Goldstein, and for Ted Simons, have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.